All right. A couple more people are trickling in, but we'll get started. Thank you all. I love that. Muy excited. Uh, we all are. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for being here. Special thank you to Maria and Paris, of course. Welcome. Welcome. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, this is Enhorabuena. This is our new conversation series, uh, NHJ New England. And of course, in collaboration with our sponsors, New England News Collaborative and NPR, we really wanted to start this to just come together and celebrate a lot of the accomplishments of all of our Latinos, Latinx, Latines, um, you know, all of our journalists that are out there and doing the thing because there's so much just like poder, there's so much that we are all working so hard for uh, to get representation for all of us. And so we wanted to kick this off with very special guests today. So, uh, well, let me introduce myself first. My name is Sabrina. I am on the NEHJ New England board along with Vanessa, Natalie, uh, Cindy are all here. If you guys want to wave and say hello. Uh, I'm the director of engagement. So helping out with newsletters and things like that. Today, it's all about Maria Garcia and Paris Alston. Maria, of course, thank you for being here. She's the executive editor of Futuro Studios. Previously, she was at WBUR as managing editor. And I heard she was also former board, uh, formerly on the board of NHJ New England. So welcome back. Let us know if you've got any tips. <laughs> and of course, Paris Alston, thank you to uh, co-host of Morning Edition at GDH News. Previously, the host of Consider This, the podcast produced by GBH and WBUR, and both of these women are just trailblazing for us. So thank you, thank you. And again, one more mention, New England News Collaborative, um, which is headed up by Vanessa, a member of the board, and NPR helped us be here. So thank you both, and I'll let Marie and Paris kick it off. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you all for having me and Maria here. I just want to say it's such yeah. a treat, first of all, to talk to Maria in this capacity because she's a dear friend of mine, someone who inspires me and loves me <laughs> and I love her. And so I'm just, uh, <laughs> yes. And so thank you, Maria, for that. I also wanna thank NEHJ. I think it's so special that, um, you know, we're finding, I'm a member of the Boston Association of Black Journalists. And I think it's, it's really important and incredible and special that we can find ways like this to be in solidarity with one another and collaborate with one another. So thank you for that. Uh, so Maria, look at you glowing as always <laughs> in your, your wonderful like architectural digest setting there. I just, I'm so proud of you because I know this has been a long journey for you. And I was just thinking about this earlier, how it's been a little over a year since the podcast first came out and a lot has shifted for you in that time. What's that been like? It's, it's, it's been, it's been honestly really um, cathartic and like a, a moment of like just deep learning for me in my life. But before I even get to that, I just want to say like, um, I feel like this is like a conversation among friends. Like I feel like full disclosure folks, <laughs> Paris and I, like, you know, I feel like I, I consider you a pretty close friend. And so oh, yeah, um, we like talk about it a lot of things with yeah. a lot of other friends too, some of whom I see Jerome is on here. So uh, is on yeah. here, Jerome. So you're um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So when NHG was like, do you want to just like have a lunchtime chat with Paris? I was like, oh yeah, this is a safe space. <laughs> yes. This is this is this is a space with Paris that like I feel like we can really like talk authentically about our experiences. And um yeah, you know, um, so after the podcast, I took some time to, to rest. Um, I had taken on this position at WBUR um, and I just, I came at a crossroads in my life where like I, there were, um, the podcast while super fulfilling and beautiful and I'm so glad I did it, you know, it, um, it was a very like personal experience for me. So I felt like very depleted afterward because I, I put a lot of myself in it too. Um, and so it, it was like a time of like deep, deep, like internal exploring of myself and my roots and my family and like, and so it just was like a lot of emotional, yeah, it was a lot of emotions. <laughs> um, and, and I just 
feel, I just feel like my body was calling me to like restore, you know, like you need to restore, like the, there are seasons in your life and you just went through a season of like, where you invested in this project and you invested in, you know, emotionally invested and invested your time. And like, I just felt like the universe was calling me to like restore. And I just felt like really called to answer to that. And um, yeah, I'm also raising a little kiddo, you know, and, and working on a project that takes a lot of that, that just takes, so much from you um other parts of your life just naturally like you know don't get the attention that perhaps you're like investing into this project and I just like I've I've been working so <laughs> I've been working for a long time I've been working since I was like yeah. 14 years old you know like I there are wonderful I've, YouTube videos of Maria when she was um I mean you were working way before that but when you were a TV reporter <laughs> that. Oh my God! Yes, yes, that yes. are just a testament to how hard you've been working all your life. Yeah. So I was like, I need to rest, and I listened to that, and I took a rest, and I took I, I rested for some time. Um, but I also felt like, okay, but there's more. I also like I, I love the craft of storytelling, and like I still feel like I'm in this moment in my life where like I have a lot to give in that sense like I just feel like creative like creatively I'm 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 really in love with what I do right now and so I knew like it, I wasn't you know I I didn't know how it was all gonna shake out but I knew two things I knew I needed to restore and I knew that like there was still a lot of work left in me and I was lucky enough and, and like privileged enough to to like take a gamble on myself and then I and then I did I rested and then and then um and then I was in conversation with Futuro and this this position um and so I'm just yeah it feels like full circle you're right in like a year <laughs> that's what's yes. happened in the last year of my life <laughs> yeah yeah so talk more about because you mentioned that you took this break but you also were making the shift from one news outlet to another and and I think what has been notable about that is you were, you're leading public media, right? You're leading a space that actually is very white centered and moving into a space that is more specifically looking into the Latino experience. And so has, and I also know that Futura was involved in the making of the podcast. And so yeah. I have just always been wondering, you know, did you also feel called in that way too, to sort of move more into an, an environment where maybe what you were trying to do would be more, what is the word I'm looking for? Yeah, I don't, it I would, would just be like a better fit for exactly. like, yeah, yeah, for where I was. Um, well, I will say this. So, so for anything for Selena, WBR and Futuro were editorial partners. So, um, it wasn't just like a business transaction where we like co-created this project. It was like a true like thought partnership um, where, you know, I was at WBUR, you know, and I had great colleagues there who were making podcasts, who believed in this project. Um, and then we had heard that like, you know, because we talked to NPR about it and NPR was like, uh, Futuro has been trying to make a project like that. Um, so, so then we, which is super common in like the podcast world, right? Especially in like, even like in the Latinx podcast world, like there's, um, you know, there's overlap sometimes of like what people are working on. And so, yeah, after that experience, I, I just realized like what can happen, um, when you steer a project from beginning to end with like collaboration at the forefront like that was just really it was such a collaborative process um you know of course like there's some individual writing and I was writing but like all of our edit all of our edits were like collaborative and um you know with with members of the two teams and to me that was just really thrilling and it's you know like it was because you had the synergy in the room of just 
really um, bright folks, you know, wanting to make the best product um, and collaborating creatively it was just really thrilling for me. And um, after Selena, yeah, like I kind of missed it, right? Like you, you, you immerse your life in these topics and these stories that are like that you have an authentic connection with right as a human being right like I've covered many things as a journalist and like as an arts journalist you know that have like that I've connected with as a human being even if I learn about them like for the first time but this is also like it was something that just came so natural for me like my inner child was like so joyous that I got to do this. Yeah. I feel like little Maria, if, if, if like, if I got to tell like nine-year-old Maria, like one day you're going to make a living, like telling a story about Selena, you know? So, so it was like, so yeah. So I realized like the power of telling those stories. And I realized that I wanted to give that opportunity to other people. Like I wanted to expand the pool of who was making projects like this, like, projects that you feel so authentically connected to. And so I did feel feel called um, for sure in that direction. And tell us a little more about, because like you said, like not everyone gets to make a podcast or do a project about a celebrity figure that they love so much that has defined so much of their life. So like, tell us a little bit about the, the the moment, I mean, you've probably talked about this like a million times, right? But like the moment that you knew, okay, this is what I want to do. But then also how do you, how you took that to WBUR or to other people and said, and convinced them that this is going to work and you need to invest in this. Yeah. So in terms of like, when I knew like, this is what I was going to, this is what I want to do. Like, I mean, I've always wanted to talk about Selena, <laughs> like, you know, like people who know me from, I I'm a Gemini. So like, I have very, I have varying groups of friends, you know, like I'm, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I don't have to see, say, there's a lot of Gemini people. representation in here. I didn't see. <laughs> I'm a Taurus. I'm on the cusp. Yeah. A day later, I would have been right there with y'all. So I, yeah. claim, I claim it on certain years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so I know people from like very different areas of my life. Right. And from like grad school to elementary school and, you know, but like the one thread that like everybody who knows these different sides of me knows, it's like, I love Selena. So um, when I, when I um, finished grad school and I was just sort of naturally thinking about like what I was going to do next, like what kind of work did I want to do? Um, I told myself like, what would be my dream project? Like what would be my dream project? And I was like a podcast about Selena. And then I was sort of like, I was like, I'm somehow going to make it happen. I went to WBUR and I pitched it right away. Like I pitched it within like a few months, you know, because they have like a fellowship and they were like, bless your heart. Why don't you learn radio first? <laughs> which is like, which is perfectly natural. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just takes time, yeah. you know? Um, so I did. Like, I just like really immersed myself in the, in the craft and I like fell in love with it. I just fell in love with it. And also like, I loved WBUR. I grew there so much. It just, the people there are, um, are just really good people, you know, who I feel like invested in me. And um, so, so it was a time of like intense growth. And then, and then I pitched it again and they were like, not quite. <laughs> you know like thank you but not sure it's a great fit and then um finally like I think it was the third time I pitched it um uh the the podcast um the um podcast director at the time her name was Iris Adler she was like okay why don't you start sort of working on it on your spare time and like let's see what happens start exploring it but you know, it's tricky because you're going to need the music rights and we can't do it without the music rights. And I was like, that's it, RIP. Like, I'm never going to get this done. How am I going to get those music rights? And then, 
and then somehow, you know, just kept at it and, uh, you know, and then we got it. You know, I actually remember distinctly the day you had gone to El Paso, I believe it was, um, and Cristela, who is another, another one of our dear, near and dear friends who helped make all this happen. Um, she was like, oh, Maria got the music right. She was sitting in, this is like pre-pandemic. We were still at work. This was at WBUR, which is where I met Maria and, and Christella and Jerome. Um, and, <laughs> and she was so happy. And I like, first of all, I have to let people know that the artery at WBUR pre-pandemic was just this like, hub of just feminine wonderful energy like every time I walked past I swear to you it was like all these flowers popping out of the vines <laughs> and each flower was one of the women of the artery like two of them being Maria and Cristela so and she means literally we used to bring literally, like this, literally we used to bring like this deep, what what are they called like the the the, um, yeah, the like, or like, I don't know. They're like the, like the big, you mean the big- You put essential in. oils in them. <laughs> yes, the diffusers. Yeah, like diffusers, one of them yes. has a diffuser in her desk. So there's like mist and like, just imagine like all these things. So Christella is like, oh, like, I also, I'm sorry. I was in a room that was way quieter before and now people have been coming in and out. So I apologize if anyone can hear that. But, um, you know, she was like, oh, I- Maria got the rights to the music and like it was just this energy that oh like this is everything is going to work out like this is going to happen and little did we know what we were in store for um tell us about the moment that you you found out you were gonna be able to access the music yeah yeah well episode two is all about that in the podcast it, it was it was a journey it took like you know I would say like um, just under a year, like, of, you know, like I would call him, I would call Selena's dad. And the first few months, it was just like, he just like refused to talk to me. <laughs> like he just, he just didn't have the time for me, you know? Um, and he like, he would answer the phone, but then he would ultimately be like, uh, I'm sorry. Like, I, I, you know, I can't deal with this right now. I'm not interested. Um, and then, and then he would just like, not, not answer me, you know? Um, and so, and I didn't, and I also didn't want to like bombard him. So it was like a slow game where I would be like, okay, I'm not going to call him for the next couple of weeks, you know? And this went on for like many months. Um, and then I went to visit him and I went to visit him and he still, didn't say like yes or no and then I went to visit him again and like he kind of ghosted me and then I went to go visit him again and he was like yes okay <laughs> so so it was it was a journey um but like I think the moment I found out because after that after that trip like he gave me the verbal yes right like he was like yes okay all right, I'm going to do this. But then after that, it went to like attorneys, right? And then, and then like the, the actual like legal process started. And that took like a few months. So there were moments like the moment in Texas, that's when I called Cristela, where like, <laughs> where you said that she was like, oh, she got him. Like there was that moment where I got the verbal yes. And I was like, yay. And then there was a moment where like, we finally like signed the deal it was like legal and um and so that was yeah that was a really big moment too and have you have you talked to abraham since the podcast was published yeah yeah um i talked to him a few days ago um he is doing well um he um, you know, he's been reading like the, um, you know, the articles about like the backlash against Selena's record um, or the, the new record that his son produced. Um, and, but he's mostly just focused on like living his life. <laughs> you know, he goes to the same restaurant like multiple times a week and, you know, um, yeah, he's most, you know, he's like in his 80s, 
like he's just you know he's having good food and like um living his life yeah did he did he like was he happy with the work he did um yes yeah he was um he called me after he heard episode two which is the episode about him and um he said it made him cry yeah he said it made him cry and he said he was really proud of me and to keep which, pro up the which probably made you cry <laughs> <laughs> it surprised me I was like wow I don't know because what because you know like my heart was I, I was you know where we treat him like a full complex human right um and that was really important to me that he not be like this sort of caricature um but we're also not easy on him you know like if you really listen mm -hmm. to the episode like it's not a necessarily a pass it's like it's just a really like honest look you know um through my lens, you know, which is of course colored by my own experience with my father. And so, um, so I just, yeah, so I was still kind of freaked out. Like I, I was still preparing myself for like a, a call that was gonna be like, I talked to you and I wasn't expecting, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I talked to you in good faith and then, and then it comes out like this and that's, you know, I, I really was like bracing myself for that. And um, so I was genuinely like very surprised when he was like, it made me cry. I'm so proud of you. Like um, everything you wrote was so honest. Like that was, that was really surprising. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Maria. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. I just want to remind everyone, if you do have a question, pop it in and we will do our best to get to it. So Natalie is saying, asking, could you speak to the way you dealt with hearing or getting hate from listeners and how that may have impacted your mentality and the podcast, especially since this is a project and topic you're so passionate about? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I guess like what informs my answer, part of it is like, so I worked in commercial TV, <laughs> you know, like viewers have like slashed me with words, you know, like I remember one time I was like, um, I, I anchored this like public policy program at night and um and we had like live calls from viewers and like this viewer called like live on television and like got through the screening process with the producers by like pretending they were gonna like saying like a legitimate question that they were gonna ask the guests and so like they got screened and everything and then like live on television like they were just like why are you such a you're a fat cow like why are you on tv like like just so so that um you know like when I first encountered that kind of like just really intense hate um early on in my career it was really demoralizing like I remember the paralysis of like despair that I felt like the first time that I, you know, that like my boss, I had, I had, I had a boss who used to forward us like all the hate mail we used to get, which was like, now I'm just like, oh my God, no wonder I had PTSD. Like, so toxic. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, so, and so, so that, but that also like, it gave me like, it, it, you know, it gave me a really thick skin. Like it forced me, it forced me to, to find a way mentally to like move past that and to not let that penetrate me, like not let that penetrate like the idea of who I am or my own thinking about myself and that, you know, and, and like truly internalizing that the hate you hear is a reflection not of you, but of that person, like that person who called when I was live on TV, like imagine like where, what mental state you have to be in to like fake a question to a screening producer, you know what I mean? Like the mental energy it takes just to like, 
insult someone? Like how bad must you feel about yourself that you have to go to those lengths to like somehow feel better or like um, boost something within you? And so, and so I know that's easy to say, but like really internalizing that. And then also like, so that was early on in my career. And then also like now I'm just like, I'm not for everybody, you know, that's okay. Like some people, you know, like anything for Selena was thankfully. People like, just can't I- handle it. They just can't handle it. <laughs> no. And I mean, the thing is like, I get it. Like I, it doesn't, um, I get it. Like we all have like different personal tastes and like I, I some, sometimes I'm kind of intense, you know, like in my work, like I, um, I take on these big things and I go and, and I, and I think really deeply about them. And sometimes I think it's a little too like earnest for people and, and I get it like, and that's okay. You know, like and I think for Selena had really great reviews and I'm so grateful that it was received very favorably, but there were all, there were like, you know, um, a, a few like really awful reviews too. You know, there were people like mainly people who were just like, she's like whining all the time. <laughs> I remember this one review was like, I feel like I'm listening to somebody who's just like really sad and whining all the one. time. Like, I just feel like she's always crying and it's like, oh, well you know like, well it was emotional <laughs> yeah so so it's my so Gemini <laughs> you know knowing that you're not going to be for everyone and that's okay mm-hmm. Sonia is asking Sonia's curious how you decided to include yourself and your identity in the podcast uh, Sonia says I feel like oftentimes we're told not to include ourselves but you showed us how it's done and how powerful it can be. And I'm assuming that also it makes you vulnerable in a number of ways, but especially when those comments are coming in that are yeah. you know, attacking you personally. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So initially I hadn't considered too much bringing myself in. Like I, I really did not expect that it was going to be like this personal look at like my like loss, you know, over my father or like, you know, um, my relation, like my family's relationship with like racism and like colonization. Like, I just, I wasn't expecting that. Like, I just was like, oh, I'm just going to write as a girl who really likes Selena. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I was going to be sort of the extent of like how I was going to bring myself in and just like, you know, a working class Mexican American who like, like just, knew Selena by osmosis she was in the air and bringing that sort of like cultural expertise not really just not really like my personal life um but the my boss at the time who approved the project was like you know I just really feel like it has to be personal like it has to be that's what makes strong work is like work that comes from like a point of view especially in like you know, podcasting is a different form. Like you're right in journalism, we're told to sort of divorce ourselves from the story unless we're somehow relevant to it, you know, unless putting us, putting ourselves in the story is somehow necessary, relevant to the story. Right. But other than that, it's not. And I mean, I, I grew up with that mentality, of course, in like commercial television. Um, But what that, what, what, that sort of thinking in journalism is often rooted in this idea of objectivity, right? That we're able as journalists, first of all, to do that, to like divorce ourselves somehow from the facts that we're reporting on. Um, And the thing is, everything that you consume as a journalist, like all the data that you're processing, um, everything that you're learning, like it's all, you're seeing it through your lens, you know, like you're seeing it through your lens and like, there's no such thing as like coming from no place in the world, like, and just you, you, you come from the, you, you look at the world from the place in it that you occupy. And so I think to me, like owning that and um, is really important. And that's sort of like my philosophy around journalism and, um, and 
in terms of like pragmatically, like in terms of like the craft, when you're editing with your team, like when you're actually putting the thing together, what does it look like to bring that lens? What does it look like to then be like, okay, then this is gonna be a personal project. How is it also still a journalistic project, right? How do you not, how do you not um, like sacrifice the rigors of journalism, right? And and still be personal and authentic. And to, and to me, it comes down to like process. Your journalistic process still has to be rock solid. You know what I mean? Um, you have to be able to show like the process of reporting and vetting. Um, so there's that. But then also like, also you have to have editors who are gonna like corral you, you know, people and who are gonna do it lovingly. People who are gonna like hold your story with such tender care. And um, like when I'm editing, so especially something personal, like that's how I want to be with like the, the writer who I'm working with. Like they're putting, they're putting so much of their emotional energy into this work, so much of themselves. Like I want to be tender with that. Um, well, while at the same time, again, like applying this sort of like rigorous journalistic process. And, and that looks like obviously like, of course, the basics, like fact checking and, you know, make sure our accuracy and all that. But also that also looks like, um, you know, the way you actually edit sentences, you know, and like how you write a story and making sure and like going through different iterations and like seeing what works and um, seeing how much personal is too much. You know, like there were there were moments where like my editors were like, we don't, you know, we don't need this. We, you know, and there were moments where they were like, we need more. Like we I feel like there's something missing from you. And so you need just a really strong editor who's gonna hold your story tenderly, uh, but who's also gonna push you to either, you know, um, edit yourself down or give more of yourself when it's appropriate and relevant to the story, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have I, there, I have a story about me and you to pick up on that. But first I wanna ask if you, if there was ever a moment where there was something that you needed, had to push for that you were, maybe the editor were saying, I don't know if we need this, but you had to make the case that you did. Um, Yes, there's two, there's two things. And one's kind of like, just like a little, like, a, you know, like a little, a very personal kind of quirky thing that I was like, no, I don't want to lose this. And the other one is like, it was like a more sort of serious thing. But like, um, I guess I'll start with like the serious thing. Like when we were doing the episode on language and why Mexican Americans are often estranged from the Spanish language. And I, I mean, all Latino, many Latino Americans, you know, share this experience, not just Mexican Americans, but it's because of like this history of like systemic targeted, you know, stripping of culture and language that was done to our ancestors right and so it's like this inherited trauma around it and and so when we were doing that episode that was all about like Spanish and English and and our producer Kristen's journey with it and my own journey with the language um, it was really important for me to to include a passage in in the episode that talked about how you know, the, the reason I care about my son keep learning Spanish and keeping his Spanish language skills um, is not because of like for the for the language itself. Like it's it's not it's not just because like I must I'm a fan of the of Spanish and I love, you know, the Spanish language is so beautiful and I want him to keep it. And because I have often found that that sort of purity around language is often informed by like white supremacy and like a history of trying to, you know, it started with the Spanish, like trying to divorce us from our indigenous roots 
by imposing like the Spanish language, right? And then, and then wh whoever spoke the best Spanish in the Latin American caste system, you know, um, was often closest to power. Um, and, and so, so it was really important for me to say that in the podcast, like to, to say that like, you know, this purity around Spanish, it's, it, it's also like a, a colonizer informed mentality and like, and so that's not, I'm not trying to teach my son Spanish for Spanish's sake. You know, um, I'm, I, I'm trying to teach him for the sake of like generational communication because I want him to speak to my mother, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah, so that was important for me. And there was like a, ver during the editing process at some point that got deleted and I brought it back and I was like, we, we got to keep this in. Like, that's, that's not, that's non-negotiable for me. And then the other one was in the first episode when um, I start off the episode talking about like the smell of El Paso and like the way it smells here um, because of this specific plant that grows here and so I had written that like the smell like the plant releases the smell because all these like um chemicals get activated like stuff found in like rosemary and pines and citrus and they're like these compounds and it was like science talk you know for a little bit I was talking about like the compounds of the plant and why they make that smell. And my editor was like, we don't, we don't really need this. And I was like, yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> yes, we do. We do need that. And th that was just like a personal thing for me. But yeah, those two things. Yeah, I'm glad you pushed for those. So what I was going to mention was the time you edited me, which was uh, around the, I was writing this commentary piece about Black women's music in 2019, and just how I'm little did we know that was the last year that anything was going to make sense. But, <laughs> um, but that was really personal to me because it was like, yeah, I was kind of like, I don't even know if this is going to make sense for me to write, but you were immediately like, oh, I think this is a great idea, and kind of helped guide me through in a way that, like you're saying, like pushing me to be really descriptive and be, I think at, when I first, that first draft, I was holding back because I was worried about, well, it's WBUR, like I can't, I can't talk that explicitly about twerking. You're like, no, like just write it, <laughs> like just say, say what you mean, right? And I just so appreciated that. And I think that moment really came full circle when I heard, okay, so like I knew I knew the podcast was great from the first episode, but when it, when I heard juvenile back that ass up in the middle of this Selena podcast, I was like, Maria fucking Garcia. <laughs> like, she knows she knows exactly what she is doing because you made this very beautiful bridge between, like you said, you're like, it's just exactly what the episode is titled, Big Fat Politics, right? And between how that all folds into anti-blackness and beauty ideals and how they're so aligned with whiteness in American society. And so I, first of all, just wanna say thank you for that. I literally almost cried when I heard that, but I def and I definitely twerked a little bit when I heard it. And, um, um, but why, but also like, I mean, cause that is really like a huge theory that you rooted the podcast in. Um, and, and the first, the first linkage that I had ever heard from Selena to JLo to Kim Kardashian and on everything you discussed there, why was it so important for you to touch on that? Yeah, um, because I saw, like, I saw it happen, you know, um, I saw like the mainstream American, you know, point of view that is, you know, you know, that has historically been like informed by whiteness, right? Like the ideal, our ideals around beauty. Um, I saw that change in like my lifetime. Like I remember growing up, you know, in the aughts and, you know, 
the late 90s and like as a kid and a teenager and I remember like magazines you know like you know I was a young girl you know like that's a formative time like girlhood where you're getting all this messaging of like what your body should look like and um I remember the clear message that I got was like that butts should be flat <laughs> you know that butts should be small like everybody in like mainstream white culture you know always talked about like getting a small butt you know like and so now as like a grown woman that's the opposite right like everybody just wants to have like the booty and um there's exercises around it like you know there's a whole like culture around and I wanted to understand how that changed like how did it change and um I I really just because of my own like experience like I remembered um when the Selena movie came out there were like um there were auditions to see who was going to be who was going to play Selena in the movie And I remember watching the media coverage around that, right? Because it was such a huge story. It was like, there had never been auditions like this before in Hollywood, other than I think like, um, other than um, for like Gone with the Wind. Um, And so it was a big deal. And I remember watching news reports where people were like, well, whoever plays the next Selena like has to have her curves, you know, like has to fill those pants. And this was like, this was like on like mainstream Latin American like shows, you know what I mean? Like this was like on like Univision and, um, you know, all like Spanish language networks. And, um, and I remember a little bit of it in English. And then when JLo got the part, she then talked about it so much more explicitly. You know, like she she then, of course, then the era of JLo begins and like she talked about her butt. And I remember like the, the ideals of like beauty changing at this time, like um, primarily through her. And I, you know, like I... I saw this tweet, I saw this tweet, you know, um, from someone who wrote like, you know, the biggest scam in the 90s was, was that JLo had a big butt, (laughs) like, thought somebody wrote that, you know, like, like, um, yeah, (laughs) the thing is, like, she, she did, right, Um, but the thing is, like, there were women who had um, very similar curves, um, and perhaps even like bigger butts than her than than Jennifer Lopez but Jennifer Lopez in like a culture that favored flat butts was somehow able to make them appealing and I wanted to understand why like what how did J, how was JLo able to to do this um in a world where like you know black women have had bodies like that in Hollywood um, before um, for many years. And so like, what was it? And, you know, I spoke to people who had researched this and I sort of like put the dots together. And I I just really, I I really think that, you know, it was, um, you know, that it came down to, to, to the privilege that, um, Jennifer Lopez was able to exert, you know, because of, you know, her racial ambiguity, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we could go on and on about how pervasive this has been in recent years. Um, all, of, yeah. But needless to say, I, I, I really, I wholeheartedly appreciate that because I think it, I felt seen, I mean, like, listen, I'm, I'm thin slick, not even gonna lie to y'all, like, (laughs) like, but but I felt seen in this way of just, like, because, because that is something, like, like, that 
the body shape and even like twerking specifically is something that is so like formative I think for black women and girls in this really specific way and just to like have that link made and and have that articulated in a way that I hadn't even like really put together it was just a really magical moment um thank you yeah so I'm going to pivot a little bit to some some questions we have in the chat uh, and I'm going to actually put Vanessa and Cindy's questions together um, because Cindy, let me see if I can get back to it. Cindy's asking, what advice do you have for young journalists who want to create a podcast and asking for you to really walk us through the process from conception to pitching? And then Vanessa, uh, who is a student at I want to, is that, I'm assuming Arizona State, Vanessa, ASU? Um, yeah. Okay. Is asking what advice you have for people like Vanessa who want to get into the industry? Yeah, I think first, the very first thing you have to figure out is like what kind of shows you want to work in. Because there's different sectors of the podcast world, right? You have like your public radio world, which usually focuses on like, you know, um, on long form narrative sort of storytelling. Um, and, um, you know, some, some conversation shows that usually like explore one topic or something. Um, so, you know, do you want to get into the public radio world and, and do shows about, you know, culture um, and arts or about news? Um, or do you want to get into the like super commercial, um, you know, but also super like successful by like industry terms and in, in terms of just like numbers and, you know, do you want to get into like the true crime, you know, like the wonderies of the world and like, you know, uh, sort of those those big private giants that focus on like the big blockbuster like. Um, super commercial, usually true crime shows. Um, or do you wanna find like something else, you know, or like a, an, an, an NPR show, you know, that's in the public radio world. So figure out like where you wanna, like where, what kind of stories you wanna tell, like which pocket of the industry you wanna be in. And then, um, you know, like, uh, do PA work, you know, production assistance work, you know, I think like um, doing PA work and then eventually like using the, the PA work, which is, you know, gathering sound, you know, getting out there on the field with the host or reporter, you know, um, helping to research stuff. Do that until you have just like a sense of how a podcast works. In, the, in like in the industry you want to get in and like and, the, and I'm talking just if you're super new to the industry right like just graduating college like you have you you don't you you don't have experience yet um of course there's different routes depending on like where in your career you are but I I'm talking just like early career um you know doing PA work until you sort of get the lay of the land you know until you learn how you know podcasts are like made in your specific shop and um you know what it takes to like script you know script an episode um like in long form writing and then and then you can work your way to being a producer which is like the person who actually like writes the scripts and um and then eventually to a senior producer you know and the thing is about most of these, most places that create podcasts, I mean, they, they're always looking for pitches. So once you're in the door somewhere, then you can pitch a project there, right? Um, even, if you're, even if you're just like a PA, a good idea is a good idea, you know, um, no matter who it comes from in the hierarchy. Um, and so, yeah. I would say that like that is sort of like the traditional way to to get get a show greenlit but also even if you don't go work at a place even if you're doing um 
you know, even if you're doing a, something else that's not cr- related to podcasts, you can still pitch places. You know, you can still pitch a podcast places um, in terms of like how you create a pitch. Well, one, like, um, like it depends which, where you want to pitch, right? And like what, what we're looking for. So for example, with us, like at Futuro, like the kind of pitches we're looking for is like, we're looking for stories that have three things, like all of our podcasts, we want them to have these three things, no matter what they sound like, no matter what they're exploring. One is like a fresh original voice, like the person who's making the podcast, like, um, you know, somebody who has something original to say, um, somebody who has an authentic connection to the story that they're reporting, you know, so I think voice is really important. Two, like, there has to be a story, you know, like, uh, is there going to be like riveting storytelling? And three is, you can't just tell me a story with a fresh original voice. You know what I mean? You, <laughs> you also have to sort of make meaning of the story for me. Tell me what it means. Tell me what deeper idea you're trying to say with this story. Like, um, and so a- about humanity, you know? And so those three things, like an original voice, great storytelling that makes meaning of the world. Like we want all those things in a story. So if you have a story that has those things, you're probably going to catch our attention. And in terms of like how you pitch, um, you know, I would write an email to like, you know, whomever you, you, you know, at, um, at the shop that you're trying to pitch. Um, And I would include like a one or two paragraph series overview. Like give me just in two paragraphs, the, what happens, like what's the story, who's telling it and why it matters. Those three things, which is essentially our three pillars that I just said, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me those three things in two, in two paragraphs. And then once you send that initial email, then you know, the, the person at who, wherever you're, you're pitching to, then, then they'll have like a process to work with you, um, you know, to either like, you know, they'll either, t- if, if they want to proceed with it, um, to flesh it out. And so what we do is once we get sort of that initial email from folks, we'll have a meeting with them um and to sort of just hear them out and like get more information and then if after that meeting we're still we still think like there's like there's more here then what we'll do is we'll start putting a pitch deck together with them so that includes um the series overview which is those initial two paragraphs usually fleshed out to like you know a a page or so no more than a page. And then we're gonna want like three or four paragraphs of each episode. So if you're talking about an eight episode podcast, then like we would want like three or four paragraphs telling us what happens in each episode, what it means. So what happens and what it means in each episode. Um, And then we would want like about the host, we would want like a paragraph of somebody telling us like why this host is the best host for this. We'd want you to tell us three comparative uh, podcasts. So like what would be like the peer podcasts out there that that would kind of sound like you, you know, like the podcast that you're pitching. So those are like the main things that that Um, And, you know, we work with creators to sort of flesh out their ideas. And the way we work is um, we're a studio, you know, so we work with big streamers who hire us to make podcasts. And so we bring them ideas. um, And um, so then we would work with the creator to create the pitch and then we would take their pitch to like the big streamers. And then that's how, you know, we would get a podcast greenlit. 
And any any sort of nuggets for coming up with the idea itself? Find something that you're not going to get tired of, that you can like completely immerse yourself in for a year of your life. And then you're going to come out the other end (laughs) and like not hate it. You know, that's really important. Um, And two, it has to be something that like you're fascinated in finding out. Like, you know, there has to be like a question at the heart of it, right? Like um, something that you're trying to learn about human beings, about yourself. Um, There has to be sort of like a journey of discovery. And that journey of discovery, you know, like in a true crime podcast, that's, you know, it's super simple. Like you're discovering the facts in this case, right? In a culture podcast, that journey of discovery is more internal, you know, or like exploring like a deeper theme of something around you. And so like, think about, think about a topic that has that, like a journey of discovery, you know, that a lot, that in each episode, there's going to be some sort of discovery, something new, something revelation, something that's going to have forward momentum that you know that each episode, you're going to be learning something new and it has to be something that you, you can't get tired of. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. There are a couple more questions left. I know we're hitting up against time, so I'm going to actually copy them and send them to you, Maria, and then hopefully, uh, It'd be Daniela and Sonia, if you would be comfortable sending someone. Maria may already be connected to you, but if not, if there's a way that she can get in touch with you to answer your question, if she'd be open to that, you'd be open to that, Maria. Yes, I just want to answer one question. So I I saw a question from Sonia. Can people who work for public media pitch things to Futura? Oh, absolutely. Like WBUR's public media. And we collaborated with Futuro on... um, on anything for Selena and you know Futuro is like public media adjacent we are also you know a nonprofit, and um you know the flagship show you know not on the podcast side but on the programming side with Futuro was Latino USA which was on NPR for you know nearly 30 years so like we're very close to public media and work closely with them and like very similar adjacent culture mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and if you can do it in just a couple minutes, Danielle is essentially asking a question about transitioning from, uh, well, into doing more editing and what advice you would have for someone who has about a year of editing experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, editing is like one of those muscles that um, you just have to like, continue exercising you know like um it really is one of those things that like you only get better if you do it (laughs) if you do it often um and so yeah um in terms of like if you have a year under your belt um I would say like reflect on the stories that you found the most natural to edit that like just those stories that like just felt like where you where you felt like authoritative you know what I mean it wasn't just like uh, you know where like you 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 knew that like what you were you know you had confidence the uttermost confidence in yourself like think about those moments and and then consider like you know pursuing pursuing a beat in that um you know or like finding more stories like that to edit um and i would say also you know um just what i was saying earlier is just you know it's it's inherently a position of power to edit right? Because you are sort of, um, you're checking, right? You're, you're, you're checking on things after the fact. And so always 
being aware that like the person who's turning this into you, they're inherently in a more vulnerable position than you. And so like holding that, hold, like holding that idea sort of close to your heart and your mind as you edit. And, you know, I think sometimes we forget that. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point, Maria. Um, I have one, one quick question before we do depart. Is there anything else in your Selena journey, I guess I'll call it, any, any questions you have left that you still want to explore? I, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're like, let, let me just end this with a really, <laughs> with a doozy. Yeah. Um, That's um, in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, um, there is sort of a, a sequel to Selena that I'm working on. That's not about Selena, but it's about Juan Gabriel, um, the Mexican artist. And, um, you know, whereas Selena was very much about like living in that hybrid culture, like living on the, you know, growing up on the border and being between these two worlds, you know, I want Juan Gabriel's project to be about like, what is it like to be essentially like from a diaspora, like to go back to like your origins. And like, for me, it's like figuring out what exactly my roots are in Mexico, like who really are my ancestors and like, and um, where do I come from? And that's been like informed by my son who, you know, he, um, you know, I mentioned in the Selena podcast, like, you know, he sometimes he's, he's, we're working on it, but sometimes he struggles communicating with my mom because he speaks primarily English and my mom speaks Spanish. And so I feel like this tension that I'm like, that I'm the generation who like broke the link, you know, that for the first time in our like lineage, you know, the grandchild and the grandmother can't like speak to each other as intimately as they have for generations. And that somehow like I'm, I'm, I'm the generation that did this to my lineage and like, what am I passing on to him? And so I've been thinking a lot about that, like, what am I passing on to him? And, and I want to know more about my roots. And so that the next podcast I'm doing is precisely about that. Well, we will, Jerome and I at least, and I'm sure many others are salivating in anticipation for that. So we will, we will be anticipating. We know you're going to soar from here, Maria. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everybody who tuned in. Thank you, NAHJ New England, for asking me to do this. It's been a pleasure. Thank yes. you, Karen. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm going to pop our email in the chat one more time. If anyone has any feedback or any suggestions for who you all want to talk to, please let us know. Uh, we want to keep this series going. As you all know, it was so, so inspirational just to hear both of you talk. Um, and it was really fun to be able to see you all talk as friends. So I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Much love to all. And thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.